the key thing to understand here is that when you ingest alcohol, you are, yes, ingesting a poison and that poison is converted into an even worse poison in your body. And some percentage of that worse poison is converted into a form of calories that you can use to generate energy, generate ATP. Greetings to the brightest audience in the country. This is Real Science Radio. I'm Fred Williams. And I'm Doug McBurney, Bible student, science geek, amateur comedian, Fred it is great to be back with you talking about real science on Friday. On today's show, we have a really challenging subject, Doug. We're going to cover a lot of interesting data to go through, and it's all related to the consumption of alcohol. We're going to look ah. at what the latest science says about this topic, and we're also going to look and see what the Bible has to say about it. We're going to especially consider what neurobiology scientist Andrew Huberman, he's, he's at uh, Stanford University, we want to see what he has to say. A lot of really interesting stuff. We're also going to check in on a recent in-depth review at the National Institute of Health. And again, we're going to look at to see what scripture has to say on the topic. And you know, Doug, I've noticed when I research for this show, you either get one or the other. You find a podcast that's exclusively on the science, or you find a podcast that's exclusively on what the Bible has to say about drinking alcohol. We're going to do both on Real Science Radio. Yes, and so and we're going to do the science part first, only because once you once you do the Bible, there's nothing more to say. You've already done the last word, so we're going to give science at least a fighting chance. We'll we'll do the science first, and then we'll go to the Bible. And I I want to just start off by saying, I've heard preachers and professors advise that it's best never to drink alcohol. Now that I think about it, that's more preachers than professors. And, and, and at first blush, Fred, <laughs> I find it hard to disagree with the advice to never drink alcohol at all. But then again, I've been a yeah. drunk in the past, and I've had friends and family who were drunks, and I've known people killed, maimed, disabled mentally and physically because they were drunks. And so I have a bias based on my own experience. And so I want to admit that up front. What I've seen and experienced influences my opinion. And sometimes when I judge by my own experience, my judgment can disagree with Scripture. And that's where I have to understand that the Scripture is right and I'm wrong and no one should advocate unscriptural advice or policies. Doug, I, I know what you mean. Um, you know, whenever I suspect that to be the case with myself, when I'm, you know, diverging off, like maybe heading into the weeds, you got to be like the Brians. You're uh, obligated to look into what the Bible ultimately has to say on a topic, the ultimate source of truth. So whatever I find to be true, Doug, based on what Scripture says, that's the opinion I need to adopt and again, where do people go to find the truth? You go to the Bible. So we're going to do that towards the more towards the end of the show. We're going to start with the science. We'll mix in. Occasionally, we'll be talking about Scripture while we go through the science. But the last part of the show, we're going to then focus on Scripture because that is the ultimate authority on what's true. It is. Now, I wouldn't go see a professor or a counselor or, or maybe a bartender or maybe a, psych a psychologist or a pharmacist or a doctor or a psychic or a social worker? You're saying the scripture? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Doug, there was a guy named Paul. And I, you know, I don't know if you heard of him, Paul the Apostle. Uh, he said, not to think of men above that which is written. Ah, uh, again, yeah. referring, so. to, uh, to, uh, referring to the scripture, right? Yeah, I, I can't argue with Paul. And then there's Proverbs 30. Verse 5, every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. One of my favorite verses that comes to mind is, it's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. Now, if you're a King James only guy, that's the center verse of the Bible. <laughs> anyway, that's another topic. But anyways, <laughs> so Doug, before we dive into this, because there's a lot of great content we're going to get to. We can't be remiss and forget to do the interesting fact of the oh. week. Are you ready? I'm ready, Fred. Lay it on me, brother. All right. What is the biggest kind of wine bottle? Okay. And I'll give you a clue. Because uh, okay. if you don't know right off the top of your head, I will give you a clue. Okay. It's uh, 
just think it's also one of the kings, one of the in kings, the Bible. one of the rulers uh, in the Bible. Let's do it again. So I didn't know that there was. I just thought they were all called bottles, Fred. I didn't know there were different <laughs> names. For, I, I'm not a wine guy. I never have been. So yeah, uh, neither am I. Okay, one last clue. That okay. not necessarily a king, but a tyrant. Think of a tyrant. So that'll you know, I guess eliminate the Israel, the uh, the Jewish kings. The Israel Oh, kings. okay, okay. So, uh, a tyrant in the Bible, um, a, 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 a Nero bottle. Uh, I, I, got, I got nothing, Fred. I got nothing. Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> the Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> the Nebuchadnezzar? Yeah. <laughs> You know, that flitted through my head, but I thought that would be too ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> well, so they were obviously yeah, that, drinking when they named that thing. Yeah. So it holds 15 <laughs> lit liters, which is the equivalent of 15 bottles of wine. So if you want 15 okay. bottles of wine for some reason, just tell them, hey, I'll take the Nebuchadnezzar. I'll take the Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll keep okay. that in mind uh, next time I'm hosting a, a rather large event. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So back to the topic at hand, I'd like to start again with the latest science. So we're going to rely primarily on the experience of Andrew Huberman, as we mentioned earlier. He's a professor of neurobiology and ophthalmology at Stanford School of Medicine, and he has a really popular science uh, podcast on YouTube. He did a video on this topic back in August of 2022 titled, Al What Alcohol Does to Your Body, Brain, and Health? It was about a two-hour video. And we're going to share a few of the important clips from his talk. Okay, and, and so here's what we've already learned about alcohol from science. Drinking too much, and we'll talk about what too much is according to the latest science. Drinking too much causes neurodegeneration or damage to the brain, which affects, among other things, our memories uh, and our ability to think and plan. And Fred... That's a given that every old drunk knows, even without any experiments, no data. And so we're going to focus more on what most consider uh, low to moderate drinking and its impact. Yep. Okay, so let's go ahead and play a clip from Dr. Huberman. So he's commenting on a recent in-depth study that was in Nature magazine in March 2022, and that paper is titled Associations Between Alcohol Consumption and Gray and White Matter Volumes in the UK Biobank. What this study did is it looked at the brains, both the gray matter and the white matter, of more than 30,000, indeed more than 35,000, generally healthy middle-aged and older adults in the United Kingdom who were drinking various amounts of alcohol. What they found was that even for people that were drinking low to moderate amounts of alcohol, so one or two drinks per day, there was evidence of thinning of the neocortex, so loss of neurons in the neocortex and other brain regions. So from the study he's using, just drinking between seven and 14 drinks a week has a negative impact. So Fred, this means even one drink a night, every night, has a detrimental impact on your health. Now, how this plays out, especially the every night part in light of Scripture, this will prove interesting when we get to uh, that part of the show. So stay tuned for that. Yeah, definitely. You know, because I always heard that, uh, you know, one, one or two drinks a night was good. And basically yeah. what he's saying is, no, that makes you a chronic drinker. And that's where problems start to occur. So, for example, I, I found a website, and there's a lot of them. Like, one of them is verywellfit.com, and they have an article just from a few weeks ago, Doug, titled, What a Glass of Wine a Day Does to Your Body. And so they list a lot of positive impacts. For example, boost in antioxidants, increases good cholesterol by 12%, lessens risk of heart attack by 32%, may reduce risk of stroke by 20%. They claim it's good for your gut, which is interesting. We'll get to more of this later. So, you know, Dr. Huberman has something, something to say on that. It lowers stress and anxiety. Huberman has something more to say on that later, too. And it decreases diabetes risk by 30%. So there's something here that's, you know, there's obviously contention here in what's true. 
Yeah. And so that's why we're going to look at the science and kind of, you know, hopefully make an informed decision of what's, uh, you know, what's reality. Okay. Yeah. I'd always heard that a drink a day was good. And uh, there's actually a Harvard School of Health. They have an article from April of 2022, Alcohol Balancing Risks and Benefits. And they mentioned that the latest consensus from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the Dietary Guidelines that non-harmful drinking is one to do one to two drinks a day for men and about a drink a day for women. Now, the study cited by Huberman from Nature Magazine, that challenges uh, the boys over there at Harvard and the, and the <laughs> USDA. Um, uh, and note that this is the average. So that could mean like seven cans of beer over one weekend and none during the week or one a night. And it has the same negative impact, according to... To Huberman, some studies claiming a health benefit, by the way, were associated with the me- uh, with the Mediterranean diet. I noticed that as I was doing the research, and that allows for a glass of wine a day. But that could easily be just other dietary aspects of that Mediterranean diet that improve the health. So, yeah, I think we always have to question just how much we can trust these studies when there are so many different variables, you know, uh, at play. Agreed, Doug. And later in the show, we're going to get to that NIH study that we mentioned, too, that's kind of more in line with uh, a more favorable view on maybe drinking one a day. And so, again, we'll try to allow, you know, try to get the audience to a point where they can make an informed decision with a lot of good science here. So the next thing I want to do is I want to play a clip from Dr. Huberman, and it talks about the basic chemistry of alcohol. Because of the structure of alcohol, it is what's called both water soluble and fat soluble translated into what's meaningful for you. What that means is when you drink alcohol, it can pass into all the cells and tissues of your body. It has no trouble just passing right into those cells. So unlike a lot of substances and drugs that actually attach to the surface of cells, to receptors, as they're called, little parking spots, and then trigger a bunch of downstreams, like domino cascades of effects, Alcohol actually has its own direct effects on cells because it can really just pass into those cells. So it's water and fat fat soluble. And the fact that it can pass into so many organs and cells so easily is really what explains its damaging effects. I should mention that there are three main types of alcohol. There's isopropyl, methyl, and ethyl alcohol. And only the last one, ethyl alcohol or ethanol is fit for human consumption. However, it is still toxic. Okay, it produces substantial stress and damage to cells. I'd love to be able to tell you otherwise, but that's just a fact. Ethanol produces substantial damage to cells. And it does that because when you ingest ethanol, it has to be converted into something else because it is toxic to the body. And there's a molecule inside of all of us called NAD. And you may have heard of NAD because it's quite popular. There's a lot of discussion about NAD in the longevity literature right now. NAD is present in all our cells from birth until death. The levels of NAD tend to go down across the lifespan. There are ideas that increasing levels of NAD may extend lifespan. A lot of that is still controversial, or at least we should say is ongoing in terms of the research. But nonetheless, when you ingest ethanol, NAD and related biochemical pathways are involved in converting that ethanol into something called acetylaldehyde. It's broken down into acetylaldehyde. And if you thought ethanol was bad, acetylaldehyde is particularly bad. Acetylaldehyde is poison. It will kill cells. It damages and kills cells, and it is indiscriminate as to which cells it damages and kills. Now, that, that's interesting, Fred. So the alcohol passes right through cells, right? But the big takeaway is the first substance that ethanol cons- converts to, acetylaldehyde, that's poison, Yep. Now, many listening, especially Christians, Christians will be wondering why, why did God make it this way in light of alcohol use in the Bible? And again, we'll get to that aspect later in the show, but there is an interesting design by God that is at play here involving another conversion in the liver. Let's continue listening to Dr. Huberman. That's a problem, obviously, and the body deals with that problem by using another component of the NAD biochemical pathway to convert acetylaldehyde into something called acetate. Acetate is actually something that your body can use as fuel. So what does that mean for you? 
<laughs> what that means is that if your body can't do this conversion of ethanol to acetaldehyde to acetate fast enough, well, acetaldehyde will build up in your body and cause more damage. So it's important that your body be able to do this conversion very quickly. And the place where it does that is within the liver. And cells within the liver are very good at this conversion process, but they are cells and they are exposed to the acetaldehyde in the conversion process. And so cells within the liver really take a beating in the alcohol metabolism events. So the key thing to understand here is that when you ingest alcohol, you are, yes, ingesting a poison and that poison is converted into an even worse poison in your body. And some percentage of that worse poison is converted into a form of calories that you can use to generate energy, generate ATP. And the reason why alcohol is considered empty calories is because that entire process is very metabolically costly, but there's no real nutritive value of the calories that it creates. You can use it for immediate energy, but it can't be stored in any kind of meaningful or beneficial way. It doesn't provide any vitamins. It doesn't provide any amino acids. It doesn't provide any fatty acids. It's truly empty calories. Dr. Huberman goes on to say that acetaldehyde, when the liver isn't fast enough to convert it to energy, is free to impact your health and is the effect, Doug, that you have when you feel buzzed. It's the poison that's making you feel inebriated. He then goes on to talk about how chronic drinkers or certain people who have a genetic composition that can stay in this state a lot longer and feel excited and get more energized, those are the ones that have to worry about alcoholism. They're predisposed to alcoholism. Oh, I got it. I got it. And so, hence the, the, the term intoxicated. That's what, you, that's what the buzz is. It's a toxic effect. Wow. So, yeah. let me get this straight. Alcohol is a poison that is converted in the body to a much worse poison, but then our liver can quickly dispose of that poison with the side effect of a little energy boost. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So, basically, you have a process in the liver of ethanol which is really a poison in itself. It's the initial poison. It gets converted into acid aldehyde, which is a worse poison. And then finally, the liver converts it to acetate, which is basically empty calorie energy that he says that sugar gives you a better energy than this stuff. But anyways, like anything, too much of something is never good, Doug. So if you drink oh. too much, you're going to have too much of this acid aldehyde, this, yeah. this really bad poison running through your system. Right, right. Or, or, and then the acetate, you've got the empty calories. So yeah, too much of anything. So thinking about this from a creationist perspective, um, our bodies are designed to dispose of the bad stuff in order to get to what amounts to a temporary fuel source. So if you drink small amounts of alcohol, the body will completely dispose of the poison part. Um, so it's like a switch that we have the free will to control we can choose not to drink much alcohol and get a small lift of energy that won't leave poison in our body. Or if we choose to drink too much, we're harming ourselves and potentially others. That's correct. And we'll, later in the show, we'll get to the NIH report and other science that says, well, maybe a little bit of, uh, you know, like red wine might be good for you. Uh, because I'll say right now that you're not going to hear anything Dr. Huberman says is good about alcohol. There's no benefit to it. So, oh yeah, it <laughs> would make sense that it would make sense that it's red wine that would be the only one that's good for you, since that's the worst of all alcoholic beverages. <laughs> True, at least in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, like how broccoli is one of the best vegetables with vitamins, and it has to be, exactly. happens to be one of the worst tasting pieces uh -huh. of food out there on the yeah. planet. So that's the way it goes, Fred. <laughs> yeah. So, and I don't know, Doug, if we could muse on whether or not, you know, this acid aldehol is part of the fall. Maybe it got amped up a bit. It's, uh, who knows, but it's, it's interesting. Well, this, this thing that's in our body that lets, lets us convert this to something that isn't bad. Well, I, I know I, I've heard Bible teachers, uh, even Pastor Bob, mention that there is no mention of alcohol before the, before the fall until after the flood. And, and the first encounter with alcohol is... It's just horribly awful what, what happened. And so um, I, I would have to suspect it has something to do with the fall, but that's probably a topic for a whole nother show. So, Doug, this next clip talks about the brain areas affected. 
alcohol is indiscriminate in terms of which brain areas it goes to. Again, it doesn't bind to particular receptors, but it does seem to have a propensity or an affinity for particular brain areas that are involved in certain kinds of thinking and behavior. So one of the first things that happens is that there's a slight, at least after the first drink or second drink, there's a slight suppression in the activity of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. This is an area of your neocortex that's involved in thinking and planning and perhaps above all in suppression of impulsive behavior. So if you go to a party and they're serving alcohol and people are consuming drinks, what you'll notice is that a few minutes into that party, the volume of people's voices will increase. And that's because people are simply not paying attention to their voice modulation. As other people start speaking more loudly, other people are speaking more loudly. We've all had this experience, right? Of going to a party and then you step outside for a moment and you go, oh my goodness, I was shouting. You come home the next day, you got a sore throat. It might be that you picked up some sort of bug, some virus or something. But oftentimes it's just the fact that you've been shouting all night just to be heard because as the prefrontal cortex shuts down, people stop modulating their, their level of speech quite as much. Also notice that people start gesticulating more. People start standing up and sitting down more. They'll start walking around more. If there's music on, people might spontaneously start dancing. All of this is because these areas of the prefrontal cortex normally are providing what's called top-down inhibition. They are releasing a neurotransmitter called GABA onto various parts of the brain. They're involved in impulsive motor behavior and thought patterns. And as you shut down the prefrontal cortex, that GABAergic suppression of impulses starts to be released. So people will say things that they want to say without so much forethought about what they're saying. Or they might do things that they want to do without really thinking it through quite as much, or they might not even remember thinking it through at all, or experience, I should say, thinking it through at all. We haven't talked about blacking out yet in the effects of alcohol on memory. But as long as we're there, I'll just tell you that alcohol has a very strong effect in suppressing the neural networks that are involved in memory formation and storage. This is why oftentimes we forget the events of a night out if we've been drinking. So alcohol makes us say things that we would normally restrain, right? And do things that we would normally exercise better judgment and tact. That reminds me, Psalm 39.1 says, I said, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Hmm. So if one drinks too much, they're at risk to sin with their tongue and say too much. Yep. <laughs> it makes me wonder if Hezekiah had a few too many glasses of wine back when he started bragging about all the temple wealth to those ambassadors who came in from Babylon. <laughs> well, that's an interesting thought. So, yeah, our inhibitions are, you know, we just are, we lose some tact. We start, you know, blabbing things more. Yeah. So, Doug, these next few clips, I think they're real eye-openers. They were for me. And I think probably for very few watching or listening to our show, they won't be aware of this. Uh, it's, and really, it's how some of this stuff perpetuates while you're not drinking. So the key thing to understand is that when people drink, the prefrontal cortex and top-down inhibition is diminished. That is, habitual behavior and impulsive behavior starts to increase. Now, what's interesting is this is true in the short term, so after people have one or two, maybe three or four drinks. But it's also true that the more often that people drink, there are changes in the very circuits that underlie habitual and impulsive behavior. Okay, this is really important to highlight, so much so that I want to drill into it a little bit more deeply. For the person that drinks, say, every Thursday night or every Friday night or goes out only on Saturdays but every Saturday, there's evidence that there are changes in the neural circuits of the brain that control habitual behavior and impulsive behavior, and they are modified and strengthened in ways that make those people more habitual and more impulsive outside the times in which they are drinking. And when they drink, impulsive and habitual behavior tends to increase even further. Wow, so now that I was not aware of, Fred. So basically, our reduced inhibitions and impulsive behavior while we're drinking, that carries over even when you're not drinking. That's an eye-opener. And again, he's referring to the chronic drinker that he's defined as, or these studies have, as having 7 to 14 drinks a week. That could be one every night, or that could be, say, three or four each night on the weekend. So 
This another Bible verse for me comes to mind on the wisdom of tact and bridling the tongue. There's so many verses, Doug, in the Bible about bridling the tongue. And this is from Proverbs 21, verse 23. Whoever guards his mouth and tongue keeps his soul from troubles. Boy, isn't that true? So, Doug, there's a few more physiological changes that persist for chronic drinkers. This isn't the only one. And both of these involve the hormone and neurotransmitters serotonin and cortisol. Right, right. And so for those who don't know what serotonin is, uh, the Cleveland Clinic gives a pretty good definition. Serotonin is a chemical that carries messages between nerve cells in the brain and throughout your body. When serotonin is at normal levels, you feel more focused, emotionally stable, happier, calmer. Low levels of serotonin are associated with depression. Uh, many medications used to treat anxiety and depression and other mood, uh, so-called mood disorders, they often target ways to increase the level of serotonin in your brain. Those are those selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that we've all heard of that are prescribed basically like candy these days to anyone who's having a bad day. So I'm, I'm not a big fan. Yeah, I hear you. So Let's hear what Dr. Huberman has to say about how alcohol affects the levels of serotonin. It's very clear beyond any doubt that many of the circuits in the brain that are involved in mood and feelings of well-being and also sort of self-image and how we see ourselves employ the neuromodulator serotonin and alcohol when we ingest it and it's converted into acetylaldehyde. It goes and that acetylaldehyde acts as a toxin at the very synapses, the connections between the serotonergic neurons and lots of other neurons. In other words, when we ingest alcohol, the toxic effects of alcohol disrupt those mood circuitries at first making them hyperactive. That's right, making them hyperactive. This is why people become really talkative. People start to feel really good after a few sips of alcohol, at least most people do. And then as they can ingest more alcohol or as that alcohol wears off, serotonin levels and the activity of those circuits really starts to drop. And that's why people feel less good. And typically what they do, they go and get another drink and they attempt to kind of restore that feeling of well-being and mood. Now, typically what happens is that as people ingest the third and fourth, maybe even the fifth drink, there's an absolute zero chance of them recovering that energized mood, right? Most people, as they drink more and more, will now start to feel more and more suppressed. So he goes on to say that this reduced level of serotonin persists even while not drinking, even those days between, you know, the night you might've had some alcohol and that your body will desire that next beer to restore that level of serotonin. To, so to summarize the serotonin problem, the chronic drinker, which let's be honest, is pretty common. I mean, just thinking yeah. of the now what's defined as a chronic drinker, that's a lot of people I know, a real lot of people I know. Yeah, that's all, it's almost everybody. Yeah, you, yeah. So these chronic drinkers, this yeah. serotonin problem, it can lead to long-term depletion of these levels, which can result in persistent mood problems, such as increased susceptibility to depression and difficulty experiencing you know, pleasure or regulating emotions. There's a similar effect, Doug, with the hormone and neurotransmitter cortisol. And that's the body's primary stress hormone. It's really interesting. And it helps the body respond to danger or stress. People who drink regularly, so this again could be just one or two drinks per night, or it could be somebody that drinks just on Fridays or just on Saturdays, or maybe just on the weekend, two to four drinks. Well, those people experience changes in their hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis that result in more cortisol, more of this so-called stress hormone being released at baseline when they are not drinking. This is really important. And as a consequence, they feel more stressed and more anxiety when they aren't drinking. Okay, so we have yet again um, an after effect of drinking that I'll bet most listeners were not aware of. The mood and or, or the stress relief that you might get from the, the beer after work to, to give you temporary relief, but it raises your stress and anxiety when you're not drinking. Now, if you've ever been a drunk, Fred, and you quit drinking, you're quite aware of this effect. But most of the people in the audience probably not aware. 
Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I, yeah, I, I never realized that some of this stuff carries over when yeah. you're not drinking. So you may get this temporary relief from uh, stress or mood swings. Oh, I'm going to have that, you know, I think I'll have a beer tonight because I'm really, you know, boy, today's, it was a tough day at work. It's going to be nice to relax. Uh, and if you do this chronically, you really, when you're not drinking, like during the day, or maybe during the week, if you're only doing it on the weekend, you're going to have higher levels of stress. It's like counterintuitive, but that's what happens. And so, and by the way, on cortisol, Doug, he does hint that uh, even low alcohol content consumption can lead to, you know, stress levels being slightly increased when you're not drinking. So I want to play mm. another clip from Dr. Huberman where he summarizes these effects to really just to drive the point home. If people are ingesting alcohol chronically, even if it's not every night, there are well-recognized changes in neural circuits. There are well-recognized changes in neurochemistry within the brain. And there are well-recognized changes in the brain to body stress system that generally point in three directions. Increased stress when people are not drinking, diminished mood and feelings of well-being when people are not drinking, and as you'll soon learn, changes in the neural circuitry that cause people to want to drink even more in order to get just back to baseline or the place that they were in terms of their stress modulation and in terms of their feelings of mood before they ever started drinking in the first place. Well, that's a good summary, Fred. At some point, we're going to jump into the biblical question of, of alcohol and its apparent use in Bible times, because right now things sound pretty dire for anyone who wants a drink. It almost sounds like if you start drinking, don't stop. Or, I don't know, I guess, I guess it, it buttresses the old Irish saying from South Buffalo, you can't drink all day if you don't start in the morning. <laughs> well, you know, Doug, not to beat a dead horse, even my occasional Captain and Coke, or maybe you have that occasional beer on the weekend, or you're a chronic drinker, or whatever, we're not done with the dire news from Dr. Huberman. But here's another interesting take on what alcohol does and in this case what it does to the gut you have a brain you have a gut that gut runs from your throat down to the end of your intestine your gut and your brain communicate by way of nerve cells neurons and nerve connections the vagus nerve in particular and by way of chemical signaling your gut also communicates by way of chemical signaling and believe it or not, by way of neural signaling too, to your liver. And as we talked about earlier, the liver is the first site in which alcohol is broken down or metabolized into its component parts. The liver is also communicating with the brain through chemical signaling and neural signaling. So we have the gut liver brain axis. And what you find is that people who ingest alcohol at any amount are inducing a disruption in the so-called gut microbiome, the trillions of little microbacteria that take resident in your gut and that live inside you all the time and that help support your immune system and that literally signal by way of electrical signals and chemical signals to your brain to increase the release of things like serotonin and dopamine and regulate your mood generally in positive ways. Well, alcohol really disrupts those bacteria. And this should come as no surprise. I mean, earlier we talked about this and it's well known if you want to you know, sterilize something, you want to kill the bacteria, you pour alcohol on it. The net effect of this is actually to disrupt the neural circuits that control regulation of alcohol intake. And the net effect of that is increased alcohol consumption. So this is just terrible, right? I mean, so you take in something that disrupts two systems, the gut microbiota, and it disrupts it in two ways. It's killing the good gut microbiota and it's allowing the bad bacteria to move from the gut into the bloodstream. You've also got pro-inflammatory cytokines coming from the liver, and those converge or arrive in the brain and create a system in which the neural circuits cause more drinking. That's a bad situation. And this is why people who drink regularly, even if it's not a ton of alcohol, again, of the sorts of patterns of drinking I talked about before, and certainly for those that are chronic heavy drinkers, what you end up with is a situation in which you have inflammation 
in multiple places in the brain and body and the desire to drink even more and to further exacerbate that inflammation and the gut leakiness. Now, oh, wow. So he goes into even more detail on how all of this process works. It's very interesting. Uh, and Doug, he actually had a strange comment around this part of his uh, video podcast. And he said he would not have de designed the system this way. <laughs> ah. oh, oh, I believe Dr. Huberman has made it clear that he, he believes in God. I, I know he said recently on a podcast that um, all the elements of science are entirely compatible with the idea of there being a God. Um, and, and that he regularly he says he regularly reads the Bible. Um, he also referred to humans and animals in a way that they're distinct from one another. So my guess is he doesn't buy into uh, all the evolutionary nonsense, but, but he may be keeping his belief in God or any other overt signs of spiritual intelligence. He might be keeping that a secret in order to keep his gig at Stanford, but that's just a guess. That's kind of my same speculation. That's, that's all it is, but there are clues that we know he believes in God, and hopefully he's a Christian, Doug. Um, but I do think he needs to be careful about questioning God's design. I was at uh, church this yeah. weekend on Sunday morning, and they happened to mention the verse that starts in Job chapter 38, you know, the first paragraph. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, it's not something I want to hear from God at any time yeah, right. in my life or after I right. um, you know, leave this planet. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without wisdom? Well, I tell you, Fred, I don't, I don't ever want to hear that question from God. <laughs> well, you know, I wish I was half the man that Job was. And things ultimately did work out really well for him. Anyways, I do hope Dr. Huberman is a Christian, and regardless, I would caution him and anyone, regardless of your faith, not, do not question God's design. I mean, how many times have we heard, actually, evolutionists question things like the design of the eye, the eye's yeah. wired backwards, and all that stuff turns out to not be true, and you're talking about a, a very elaborate, just incredible design. So, yeah. and Doug, I've always liked what you've said, and I've I've started using it myself. So I'm, you know, I'm plagiarizing you when I say I, I love. What, oh, great! <laughs> I love when you say that. You know, we're all going to be before the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to have all our papers graded, and we shouldn't be <laughs> surprised at the big red X's that we've gotten certain parts of our papers. <laughs> There's going to be a bunch. I'm convinced. All of our papers get corrected on Judgment Day. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Now, by the way, I don't think Andrew Huberman is a Christian. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I don't think a Christian would say that science is entirely compatible with the idea of there being a God. That I, It would be better for a Christian to not say anything. So I'm going to give uh, Andrew Huberman, Huberman the benefit of the doubt and assume he's not a Christian and hope that he would get in touch with me so that, or, or, or you so that we could help him with the gospel. Yeah, that's a good point. The benefit of the doubt, in that case, it's important yeah. that he's on the right side there. So, Yeah, but, but I do appreciate all his info on the gut. That was news to me. Oh, yeah, it is. It's, uh, all his stuff here has been super eye-opening. So, you know, as it pertains to the health of our gut, he goes on to say that we can essentially, you know, mitigate this problem, almost even cure it by eating low-sugar fermented foods. I mean, you could eat high sugar fermented foods. I sure that'll be fine too, probably, but you're just going to get fatter. Yeah. But the point <laughs> is, you know, <laughs> eat things like yogurt or sauerkraut after you've had a, a beer. I, I'm going to start doing it because basically okay. this helps mitigate that problem because the alcohol is killing the good bacteria and really promoting the bad bacteria to leave the gut. So, you know, if you like y yogurt or sauerkraut, uh -huh. Go for it. I love sauerkraut. I just don't eat it enough. Oh, man. I grew up so, on sauerkraut. So, Fred, we had sauerkraut at least once a week at my house growing up. Um, I, I have not eaten it since I left home, uh, at least not on purpose. Uh, you, now, yogurt I can deal with better than sauerkraut. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't have yogurt unless I find the, you know, the non-lactose version. So... Oh, yeah, that's no good. No, that that's like that's like gluten free cookies. No, that just doesn't <laughs> yeah. work. Yeah, <laughs> true. Well, I'm glad you can have some sauerkraut, Fred. That means you can have a beer after work. If today's real stressful, yeah, you have a make beer sure and I have a bowl a of sauerkraut. And sauerkraut. How about that? That's there a great you, there combo. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, Doug, to summarize, essentially there are four things that Dr. Huberman is saying to watch out for with alcohol. And this is aside from the obvious, you know, drinking too much and driving, hurting yourself, swimming after you drink, and just stupid things people do, They all kinds of accidents by drinking. No, we're talking about the four things to watch out for. If you're just this chronic drinker that isn't really necessarily getting drunk or it gets to a hungover state, they're having one or two a night. So here are the four things, the four summary um, items that Dr. Huberman refers to. One, so reduced inhibitions, for example, less tact. So more impulsive behavior, even when not drinking. That's the key, even when not drinking. Two, diminished baseline of serotonin, so your mood is slightly worse, even when not drinking. Increased baseline of cortisol, which can increase level of stress and anxiety, even when not drinking. And then finally, the destruction of good bacteria in your gut, which has the added side effect of a process that leads to craving more alcohol. There's actually a chemical process that he went in on to describe you now actually crave more alcohol. So, Doug, a few final points from Dr. Huberman on his presentation, on his uh, podcast. So, eating something before drinking does slow the process, but once you've had a beer or glass of wine, because alcohol is water and fat soluble, it's already in your blood system. It's really fast. So, food can only blunt the effects if you eat eat something and it's whatever, if you have an alcohol drink after that. Yeah. So sleep is disrupted after even one beer or wine. So realize you're disrupting your sleep. They're chronic drinkers or people who have gene variants allowing them to consume more alcohol and still retain higher serotonin levels after several beers. And these are the people that are prone to alcoholism. Absolutely. Genes matter. And so does age. People who have immediate relatives who are alcoholics or those who start drinking at younger ages are predisposed to alcoholism. He talks about blackout drunk, and that doesn't mean you just pass out. And It's when you're blackout drunk, you're totally alert and awake, but you don't remember anything. If you ever have that happen, you have have to be concerned about alcoholism. So Dr. Huberman also believes that there are low or no positive effects with consumption of red wine, which is interesting. We're going to get more into that on the next show. Hmm. Resveratol isn't supported by peer-reviewed research, according to Dr. Huberman. And here's another one that he mentions. There's a reduction of gray matter volume or brain thickness as a function of how much alcohol you drink. Mm. So you could almost say empty-brained or small-brained if you drink too much alcohol. He mentions that folate and B12 might partially offset alcohol impact on cancer. He, of course, mentions do not drink when pregnant. Let's talk about that a little bit more on the next show. Alcohol consumption might increase testosterone. And for the chronic drinker, at least, there's some good news here. The neural circuits that he talked about can be completely repaired by abstaining from alcohol for between two and six months, depending on, you know, your physiology. So there is a mitigating factor here right. uh, that he did. Uh, yes, yes. And as any, as any old drunk who's ever quit drinking will tell you that it, it, takes, it takes several weeks, if not several months, to... Uh, to recover. That's that's definitely true. Yeah. And also, he does mention for hangovers, you could just take a cold shower because then you're going to have adrenaline rush and dopamine, and apparently that might help. Uh, oh, good. So he doesn't recommend another beer. That's that, that, good advice. <laughs> exactly. Doug, that's the science from Dr. Huberman. I think we're going to have to do a, a part two and dive in to just a little bit more of the science. Yeah. And we got to get into the scriptural component because obviously that's going to be the final barometer of truth and what's, you know, what we can do. And, you know, I think as Real Science Radio, we'll come up with our own recommended guidelines for alcohol at the end of the next show. Absolutely. So we'll leave that as a teaser for, uh, to watch that. There's going to be a little bit more science we had, we didn't get a chance to get to. And then we'll, uh, we'll dive into what scripture has to say on alcohol. Sounds good, Fred. I look forward to it. All right. So for Doug McBurney, I'm Fred Williams of Real Science Radio. May God bless you.